it seems to me that one of the greatest secrets that has been kept from us and yet given to us by NASA themselves for the last three or four decades, they constantly tell us that there's water everywhere in space. But that's not what we perceive, right? If I told you there's water in space everywhere, you'd say, well, you're an idiot. Space is a vacuum. We know space is a vacuum. There's nothing there. And yet that's not the case. And when you start researching space and water, it becomes mind-blowing. Article after article after article after press release and press release about water in space in amounts that are completely mind-blowing. Ocean worlds, water in the solar system and beyond. In 2009, NASA found a sprawling cloud of cold water vapor around a solar system to a nearby star. The water vapor could eventually deliver oceans to dry planets that are forming in the system. It's water vapor. It's not water in some weird thing. It's water vapor they're talking about here. Could eventually bring oceans to new planets forming. This is just a little disturbing. And just hold on to your faith. The famous eye of God, nebula, actually weeping tears of water. Wow, so there's water coming out of this nebula. This is not just a solar system. This is a nebula. This is a place where galaxies are born. Stars and galaxies are born in a nebula. And water is coming out of this. Can you imagine the size of the water that's coming out of a nebula? It's like one drop of that will engulf our entire solar system. And it just goes on. You know, oceans detected in, inside Saturn's moon and stars found shooting water bullets. NASA confirms best ever evidence water on Mars. Water from Orion. Now there's water coming out of the constellation of Orion. And, and this is a big one. Star found shooting water bullets. I mean, a, a star shooting water bullets. A star is supposed to be a sun. There's water on a star? I, I um, challenge you after this this evening, go to the pub tomorrow, strike up a conversation with somebody and tell them, did you know that there's water on the sun? What do you think they're going to tell you? You're a freaking idiot. They don't have enough information. So, it's, we're getting to this point now that you can't have a discussion with somebody about any subject unless they have sufficient amount of information. Because they'll constantly block it, block you, tell you you're stupid, and so forth. So, it's tricky, and we have to navigate this river of discussion and debate very gently and very carefully because we're going to lose friends and families and break up partnerships because of new knowledge and information that some of us embrace and others discard as BS. So then they do a study, NASA, and they say basically all stars have water. This is the conclusion. Uh, I'm not going to read the fine print. You can do this yourself. All stars have water. That's the conclusion. And Stella Sprinkler nourishes galactic garden. Wow, I didn't realize there was a garden out there in the cosmos. It's being watered by some Stella Sprinkler. That's lovely. I'd love to see this garden. I wonder how big those plants are, dude. Man. Wow. This is like bigger than the tree in, on, on Pandora. <laughs> and, um, and then water on the sun. Stanford University. She tells us that there's water on the sun. And even better, a more appropriately named university, Waterloo University, tells us that there's water on the sun. And I'm going to leave this here because you need to go and do some of your own research here. It seems to me that the universe and the water are the same thing. On the left is one of those deep space images of the universe. On the right is a picture of a swimming pool. And I think you start seeing what's going on here. And the lies and the deceptions are getting bigger and bigger. Also keep in mind that many of the images that we get shown by NASA come from radio telescopes, not from optical telescopes where they actually photograph an object. It's a radio telescope that brings radio signals and then they convert those into beautiful images through NASA's artistic impression graphic designers. Right? So these are often you don't see pictures. These are radio telescopes. Our entire 
our own very, our very own solar system is completely surrounded by water. They tell us it's ice, but can we believe them? Is it ice or is it water? Like water vapor, like that other thing. I don't know, but we call it the Kuiper belt. It's a belt in a disk that surrounds the outer perimeter of the disk of our own solar system. Our solar system is a disk. Keep that in mind. I'm going to come back to this. So is the Kuiper belt this huge amount of ice Right? And that, that whole thing is now completely engulfed by more water called the Oort cloud. That completely engulfs our entire solar system. It looks something like that. So, suddenly, our own solar system is made up of water, surrounded by water, and yet there's supposed to be vacuum in space? How does this work? Where does that vacuum in the water how does that break up? How does it work? Where does the water go? Where does the vacuum begin or end? And it's, it's a little confusing for me. But uh, we know that there's water in space because they keep telling us there's water in space. So suddenly uh, the Bible makes a lot more sense to me because I've always had a problem with one of those statements in the opening phrases of the Bible. When the Spirit of God moved over the waters... How can the Spirit of God move over the waters when nothing has been created yet? Surely water should be part of the creation. And I'm starting to see now why water is so sacred. Is it possible that water is so sacred because water is actually foundation of all creation? Or is connected to all creation? Well, if you look at chemistry, it seems like it. Because between oxygen and hydrogen, you've pretty much the same, got the same elements in every other chemical reaction or chemical formula. Hydrogen and oxygen a part of pretty much everything. You cannot separate it. Hydrogen and oxygen make water. So it starts to get a really interesting and compelling to think that water is actually made up of space. And God said, let there be light. So the Spirit of God is moving across the waters and it's the sound of the Creator that makes the light. How does that work? Well, in modern science, it's known as sonoluminescence. When you put a sound frequency into a body of water, after a little while, a beautiful bubble appears filled with light. Sound in water, sonoluminescence. God said, let there be light. Is it possible that water is the stuff that holds the universe together? I'm beginning to believe that. I'm no longer believing the lies of NASA and their fake CGI images that they send us and give us. Sorry. In 2013, astronaut Luca Parmitano almost drowned on a spacewalk. How does a how, how does an astronaut almost drown in a spacewalk? And they covered it up by putting out a press release. So it's like it's they always have a back door. They always have a back door out. But if space is water, where does the watery space begin? Where is the edge? Well, if we start listening to what the Bible tells us in some ancient scriptures, maybe we should listen to all of it. It says, God placed the firmament in the sky to separate the waters of the heavens from the waters below. I have no idea what that means, but I'm starting to get an interesting picture. And then how did God create the flood? It says, tells us that God opened the gates of heaven to let the water pour in on the earth. Okay, now I'm starting to see how you can create a flood. If, water is, if space is water, it's starting to make more sense. And then suddenly, vacuum just becomes a myth and not a scientific fact. Because the simple basic physics of a vacuum in space is just doesn't work. For any scientist that actually just think about this, or physicist, the, the whole thing of vacuum in space is just not compatible with any kind of physics formula or physics that we can put to it. Where does the vacuum begin? Vacuum is one of the most powerful forces of nature. Where does that vacuum begin? We often get confused between gravity free and vacuum. They're not the same thing. Just because there's no gravity doesn't mean you're in a vacuum. And just because you're in a vacuum doesn't mean there's no gravity. The two are not the same thing. So don't get confused by vacuum and gravity free. What you can't do in space or in a vacuum, what you can't do in infinite vacuum is you can't propel sound. You can't have explosions, fire, propulsion, jet engines, rockets, none of this stuff. 
can't do that because there's nothing to propel against. And then these guys on YouTube that make these vacuum tubes that go, oh, look, I created a vacuum tube in my garage. I'll show you that you can propel a r rocket in a vacuum. I go, really? You've lost your brain. You're comparing a fishbowl in your garage to the infinite vacuum of space? You really lost your mind, dude. And, uh, and then you start watching like SpaceX sending a rocket up into space and they're very well trained a uh, presenter that's got all the buzzwords. She knows all the lingo and all the buzzwords. And at one stage I was watching and she says, and the rocket is about to enter the vacuum of space. Uh, really? And millions of people are watching this and they believe this, you see? They just, oh, the rocket just entered the vacuum of space. Where? How, how did it, where? Please freaking explain that to me. In scientific terms, not in BS terms. Oh, you won't understand it. No, please try me. I want to understand this. Explain to me where that vacuum begins. And we start realizing that everything we've been told about the moon, moon landing, space, is probably one of those big hoaxes. It is a tough one to swallow, but we're going to have to start swallowing it sooner than later. The, sooner they, the longer they string us along, the, longer this is, the worse this is going to get. So... For those of you that still believe that we landed on the moon, I'm going to shatter that for you right now. If you've not seen Jay Widener's Kubrick Odyssey, that's the first point of departure. Watch Jay Widener's Kubrick Odyssey, and you will never believe another word NASA tells you. You'll never ever believe that we landed on the moon, and you'll understand um, Stanley Kubrick's role in this entire thing, and why he eventually died when he pushed it a bit too far with eyes wide shut. But basically, everything you've ever seen from the moon, all the images or footage of the astronauts was shot by Stanley Kubrick in the early days. I'm not sure who shot the, the more latter part, possibly him as well. Um, but the earliest uh, moon landings and all that shot by, uh, by Stanley Kubrick with his very, very specific style of cinematography. It's a dead giveaway. And uh, that gave him a, basically the freedom to make whatever movies he wanted. He then made a movie called The Shining to tell us that he was the guy that shot the moon landings. And for some people that still think the moon is a, is a real physical thing in the sky, that we landed on this physical object in the sky, the image of the moon that we see from Earth is part of the agenda. It's part of the particle physics agenda that I'm coming to to make us believe of particles that make up everything in creation. And we need to reconsider what the moon is because after you've seen the lunar wave, you'll never think of the moon the same way again. And this is what the lunar wave is. The first one was filmed in 2012 and it's this weird electronic glitch that, that goes across the moon every so often. It's been filled hundreds of times now, not just by one person, but by many other photographers with very high definition lenses. And pay attention because it's like the old computer and TV screens. You see this line, this electronic line move across the moon, follows the edges, the contours, and the line moves from bottom to top, from side, from left to right. It moves in all different directions. This has become known as the lunar wave, which gives us a very clear indication that the moon is not what we think it is, and it's most likely a hologram. <laughs> Welcome to the Crow Discovery Project. Uh, again, this is the 2012 lunar wave footage, the best example of the lunar wave that we have. And I'm going to show you some things that sharp-eyed followers have there? spotted long, long ago and that I have talked about, but I have never taken the time to carefully illustrate. And what I'm going to show you here means an awful lot. But I'm also going to show the pulses that happen in the lower left limb of the moon. So watch the lower left there and I'm just going to run a straight slowed down view 30 percent. If you've got sharp eyes you'll see what we detected on a 60 inch monitor. Now look inside the circle. 
there's a pulse that goes from lower left to upper right, and in the next circle, the yellow one, there's a lateral sweep that goes from left to right straight across the screen, and this is all going on as the wave is starting at the bottom. So now look at the pulses backwards and forwards. That's backwards, this is forwards. Coming from the lower left limb of the moon, you can see the pulses now that I've put filters on them, how they have a curved aspect to them. And if you've got sharp eyes, you'll see the sweep up above. Now what I'm going to show you now, we have talked about, and many sharp-eyed viewers have known that this was an important thing about this clip for a long time. Here comes the wave. Look at the dark underlined crater in the center of your screen. Watch how it's displaced, almost like you're looking through water. There goes the wave backwards, forwards, the wave hits the crater, displaces. This wave is displacing, as if you are looking through water, the entire image of the moon. Now, I've never taken the time to animate this. I have talked about it. There it is zoomed in. Now, this is running at 30%. And I'm going to zoom out, there goes the wave to the top, and there's going to be another wave coming in from the bottom. Now I'm going to run this at 30%, so as the wave comes in, you can choose any landmark you want. Here comes the wave from the bottom to the top. Choose any little landmark you can see there, and watch it be displaced. Now that round looking ring crater, forwards, backwards, forwards, backwards, and one more time forward, and I'll zoom out and you can watch it go all the way to the top. Again, this is at 30% with quite a few filters like Find Edge and some other things, Invert. Okay, I think you get the, the gist of that. Uh, this has been filmed many times now, not just by one person, so it seems to me that, uh, that we're not looking at anything physical and that this hologram or whatever the hell that is is possibly hiding something that's really behind it. Um, and then the, the Mars landing, you know, and, and when, when we first landed on Mars, I got so excited. I was just really excited about the Mars probe and all the pictures from Mars. Boy, it was like one of the happiest days of my life. So for me to come to terms and admit that this is probably a hoax is just really a tough pill to swallow. But unfortunately, we have to swallow these pills because when you start researching the whole Mars landing and uh, and the experiments and the, the training they did in the Canadian Arctic on Devon Island, I suspect that pretty much everything and all the footage we've ever seen on Mars was actually just shot on Devon Island, very far northern Canada. And uh, it's depressing, but that's what it is. And we've got to deal with it. reaches the edge after he goes as far as any man can possibly go when you put the puzzle pieces together the world looks very very different when you connect the dots because what the system wants to do right across society is get people to focus on dots, individual dots, a religion, family, job, football team, whatever. The idea is to keep humanity constantly bewildered so we don't know where we are, who we are, what even reality is. But when you connect the dots, and so many of them as we'll see today, have on the face of it no connection to some of the others. When you connect the dots, the light goes on and suddenly the picture forms. Russia's space agency claims to have found sea plankton on the outside of the International Space Station. Wait, what? 
A report in ITAR TAS quotes Russia's ISS mission chief saying, We have found traces of sea plankton and microscopic particles on the illuminator surface. This should be studied further. The report claims this finding is part of a long-term study, which proves some life can exist in space. The discovery apparently occurred after Russia's two cosmonauts currently on board the ISS started cleaning off the station's illuminators. That's space language for windows. The astronauts reportedly discovered the plankton after examining the residue on the illuminators. State-run TV network RT confirmed the news, also referring to the find as a part of a study. Since the plankton isn't native to the ISS resupply launch sites in Kazakhstan, the prevailing theory appears to be that this plankton was blown into orbit from the surface of the ocean by rising air currents. If that sounds pretty far-fetched to you, then don't worry. NASA's a little skeptical of the news, too. A NASA spokesman told Space.com the agency hadn't been informed of the discovery and noted the Russian astronauts weren't looking for plankton while cleaning the windows. What they're actually looking for is residues that can build up on the visually sensitive elements like windows. That's what they were taking samples for. When you connect the dots, the light goes on. And uh, Houston on one with the water and the helmet report. Go ahead. Yeah, Terry was saying that uh, he's got some water in his helmet. He just noticed it um, a minute ago. Uh, it's about three inches in diameter. It's kind of pulling on the on the front side of the helmet above his eye level. And he does feel a little bit of squishiness in uh, in the back of the hat. Not bad. I'm, I'm watching. I, I don't see anything uh, dramatic. And uh, if you agree, I'll just go ahead and uh, take him off. Well, Terry, you look better than I remember you. When you connect the dots, the light goes on. Well, a potentially deadly situation forces one astronaut to cut his spacewalk by more than half, a, by more than half after an equipment malfunction in outer space caused him to nearly drown inside of his own suit. It's an incredible story. Trace has more for it. Us on this in Los Angeles. Yeah, we all know, Martha, these spacewalks have become kind of routine when you're out there, but the bottom line is every astronaut knows when they step out of that capsule or space station that even the smallest nick in their spacesuit can mean instant death. This was an Italian astronaut. His name is Luca Parmitano, and he was on a six-and-a-half-hour spacewalk. He was about an hour and a half in when he felt water on the back of his hands and then on the back of his head, and the water was increasing. Listen to him now. Try to figure out what the problem is. Play this. Yeah, the PC, it might not be the water bag. There's no other place for it to come. Unless it's sweat or urine. I guess it must be sweat, then. Yeah. How much can I sweat, though? My head is really wet, and I have a feeling that it's increasing. Yeah, I mean, how much can you sweat? He knew it was definitely increasing over his eyes and then his nose and then his mouth. And in zero gravity, the water just kind of pools like a big blob. And it's not like he can just step back inside the capsule or the station and then pop his helmet off. It took 24 minutes to get him back inside. And then you see there another 11 minutes to get his helmet off. NASA says he could easily have drowned, but he was very calm the entire time. Listen. You can imagine, you know, you're, you're in a fishbowl. So go stick your head in a fishbowl and, and try to walk around. And that's not anything that you, you take lightly. And certainly EVA is dangerous already. And he did a great job of just keeping calm and cool and uh, getting his way back to the airlock. Uh, did he ever? About a gallon of water actually seeped inside his helmet. Still unclear if it came from his cooling system or from his drinking system, but as you might imagine, Martha, NASA wants to figure that out before they send somebody out outside again to have the same thing happen all wow. over again. When you connect the dots, the light goes on. Amazing. I'm here in Houston, Texas at NASA's Neutral Buoyancy Lab, the NBL. I'm here with Chris Hull. He's a dive operations specialist three, which means you're an instructor here. Yep. Now, Chris, tell me what this facility is, because it looks like a giant swimming pool, but not like any swimming pool I've ever seen. Well, it is a giant swimming pool, but what it is is it allows us to train astronauts to go outside and do EVA, which is essentially spacewalks. 
So what they can do before they ever go into space is uh, get a chance to put on the suit and go through the tasks that they're going to be asked to do uh, if they are asked to do one. If they're asked to go outside of the spacecraft, they're prepared to do that. They know how to work with the suit. They know the tasks that they're going to be doing. And they've done it 10, 20 different times in the pool before they ever get sent and asked to do it in space. So the astronaut corps, when, you know, whatever the class is, mm -hmm. they, they get suits fitted and the EVA suits and special EVA suits for underwater. And here's where they simulate fixing a space shuttle, fixing the ISS, or working with other modules. It is. It's the same suit. It's a suit that was on station that has been decommissioned. Uh, yes, uh, some things have been made different for the water, like we use umbilicals up in space. They don't have that. Uh, in space, they have a computer on their chest. We have a mock-up that helps us uh, weigh them out, either by putting foam on it or by weight on it, depending on the subject. But all the suits are customly made to that astronaut as far as length, as far as glove. You want to make sure that it's a good fit. You're not getting hot spots. It's not rubbing on you. Uh, astronauts could be in these suits in space, eight to ten hours, mm -hmm. and our pool they're in for six hours at a time. How does this facility, how does being underwater, what do you do to make it simulate gravity, zero gravity as much as possible? Well, we have the three-dimensional axis. They can go up, they can go down, they can go left, they can go right, they can turn upside down. Uh, so it's the closest thing that we can simulate right now. When the NBO was originally built, you guys made it for the space shuttle, you guys have had mock-ups of space stations, and right now there's mock-ups of ISS modules. So can you talk about a little about what those mock-ups are and how they function? Now the mock-ups that you see in the pool are one to one config different material. Obviously, it's got to hold up to the water. Uh, we don't need the electrical or any of that. None, none of the interior. None of the interior. It's all the exterior. As far as every rail, as far as every bolt, as far as where every rail should be in place. If they have to go turn a bolt 98 times, they right. have to do that in the pool because they're going to have to do it in space. So Japanese module simulated? Yes. Uh, in the far corner, we have the Japanese section. It's got the Japanese exposed palette. The Columbus is the European portion. The lab is kind of the U.S. portion. So it is an international space station, and the Russians have their own section out towards the back. Uh, do, do Russians have their own NBL equivalent? They do. It's a much smaller pool that's uh, nowhere near this size, but they do their own training uh, with their own suit. Now, the Russians don't use the same suit that we do. Uh, they use the Orlon, so they train specifically for that over in Star City. When you connect the dots, the light goes on. Next, there will be some shots about uh, uh, the boom deploy. We are very much into pre-TSS uh, deploy activities. The first thing, of course, is to deploy the boom. The purpose of the boom was to basically take the satellite away from the orbiter uh, structure. And this is an accelerated view, which normally would take about uh, 12 uh, minutes. Uh, the boom is an incredible piece of engineering. You can see it in, this, in these shots. You can see the TSS. And the actual header in the middle and all the electrical wires. Uh, basically here, uh, at this point in time, there's four of us that were awake, the four veterans, the three rookies were sleeping. And of course, the very first concern we had is to make sure that none of this uh, ball of tether starts coming back towards the orbiter. Uh, we were concerned pre-flight, and we did a pretty sure, good share of, of training pre-flight that if we had a ball of tether coming back at us, we'd do the proper evasive maneuvering to make sure we didn't have a big problem. You guys getting the image? Franklin, uh, we see a long line, a couple of star-like things, and a lot of things. Franklin, uh, we see a long line, a couple of star-like things, and a lot of things swimming in the foreground. There's a lot of things swimming in the foreground. Can you describe what you're seeing? Well, the long line is, uh, is a tether, um, and uh, there's a little bit of debris that uh, kind of flies with us, and uh, it's uh, illuminated by the sun at such low angles. So this is just a lot of stray light, and it's getting washed out uh, quickly, but uh, Quad is trying to do a, a quick, uh, good job here adjusting the cameras. Columbia, Houston, that's a much better view, uh, a lot more contrast visible. And how wide uh, does that tether appear to be? We, we see, it seems to resemble a, a much wider strand than we'd expect. Can you describe which way the, uh, the satellite is visible on that uh, strand? Satellite uh, now 100 nautical miles. Charlie, completely unzoomed, and uh, you see the full extent of the tether. I try to adjust the focus, but I can't get better than that. Okay, Claude. Thank you. Let's zoom in now.
When you connect the dots, the light goes on. When you connect the dots, the light goes on. So the, the unique experience is a, a really way, good way to describe it. Uh, you know, there's one aspect, the, uh, the part of being outside that uh, is really similar to being in the NBL, the uh, training facility, the neutral buoyancy lab, the big swimming pool we have at uh, Johnson Space Center down in Houston. Um, everything looks the same in that uh, swimming pool, but outside, you know, there's a, a big earth going by, there's uh, sunsets and sunrises to, to kind of wait you up or brighten, kind of blind your eyesight, and so just the, the view is what's uh, completely different. That's what uh, takes your breath away when you're uh, trying to get back to the business of uh, doing your work, and amazingly enough, the earth is just uh, rotating by underneath you. And, uh, you know, we talk about spacewalks, but it's a bit of a misnomer. It's more like uh, space floating. You're really not out there walking. And I guess uh, the best analogy I can uh, tell everybody is if you could imagine yourself scuba diving in a suit of armor, that's about what spacewalking is like. And the wide field planetary camera two is clear of the structure of the telescope. And now uh, Foista will be maneuvered uh, by Megan. The indicators look a good bit different than what they do in the pool, but what I see is two, uh, two black squares with a white dot in the middle. So I can describe to them what, that, what I see here, Chris. It's a lot different than the pool. So. When you connect the dots, the light goes on. Look at, listen, all these noises, and tell me this is at 400 kilometers high in the vacuum of space where there's no molecules to make the transmission of sound. Remember, they say it's 400 kilometers high, 2,500 Celsius. And, uh, it's again our another brain of air bubbles. Not one, not two. It's a gazillion. <laughs> to see how do you debunk this. <laughs> it's debris from space. <laughs> you have to be blind if you believe that. Oh, look at that. It's too many air bubbles. And more bubbles. 
uh, when I saw Eric Dubay uh, video about bubbles, you know, you think oh, maybe it was just the one or one or two, you know. But if you go in every spacewalk, every, from NASA, Chinese, Russia, whatever, if you go all, all of them have space air bubbles. That's a good fabric to, for protection of the vacuum of space. Here is a helmet and glove check. And will be fun because the helmet and glove check is to check if they have water. Uh, that's fun, water. They are in the vacuum of space, should have no, should be no water there. When you connect the dots, the light goes on and suddenly the picture forms. The multitude is always wrong. And invariably, when you look through what we call history, it turns out that way. It is the people who have challenged that that have moved us forward in terms of our understanding of who we are and the nature of the world we live in. A few centuries ago, the majority believed. Why? Because those people perceived to be all-knowing, the scientists and religious people of the day, said the earth was flat. And if you went too far, you'd fall off the edge. And people were jailed and vilified for saying, actually, it's a sphere. And then when the evidence becomes overwhelming that the earth is actually a sphere, then that becomes the new norm. And now anyone who says that it's flat is now ridiculed for believing that. answer some questions that you guys have been asking about the firmament and why on earth I would believe it exists, what proofs we have that it's there other than the Bible and us being Bible thumpers, crazy religious people, and you're asking some really good questions. And you're about to see why people like me and thousands and thousands of other people are believing that the earth is not what we've been told and that the powers that run this world, the powers of darkness, that have ran it for centuries, would actually hide the truth in a seemingly innocent way. And no, not every scientist is in on it. It's not like that at all. But yes, there are some things hidden from you about creation and who you are, and it's for a reason. And it serves a purpose and a large plan. And the shape of our earth and how it moves as I've said many times, is not the most important truth. But this awakening experience has been leading people in that direction. And hopefully it'll do the same for those of you who always have had this feeling that deep down something is off and that you aren't who you were told you are and neither is this earth. So pay attention. Do not believe anything I say or that anyone says without proving it for yourself. That's all we're saying. Be skeptical. No more blind faith that we've all had for many years. Prove all things. So let's first answer the question, what is this firmament that I'm speaking of and what proofs do I have? And the first thing that you need to know about the firmament is that it's been mentioned in the creation story as the expanse that divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And I had read that many times never understood what it meant or that there was any proof of it and just kind of pictured that being maybe where clouds were kept in deep space and that is partly true there is different levels to the firmaments but the firmament was also mentioned during the great flood when the floodgates were opened and water came pouring down onto earth that did happen this earth was flooded and for a good reason and that's an important long story and the world pretty much started over from that point. 
And a lot of people thought, well, that's when the firmament went away, was the floodgates were opened, and all of that happened. However, that's not what happened, and there is proof, and we're going to first look at the proof of these rockets that we have all watched go up into the air and seemingly appear to go straight back down to Earth in a rainbow flight path. And people say it is perspective. But luckily, we have pictures of these flight paths from the side view. And you can see that unless the Earth is really tiny, these aren't flying with the curvature of the Earth. They are flying out into the ocean, or as some have joked about, the Bermuda Triangle, <laughs> where all the witnesses vanish. And uh, you'll see here that we do understand how orbital mechanics work. That you're supposed to go 10 times faster than a bullet to get into orbit, even though we have never seen combustion that happens that fast because it would wipe out all mankind. But here's a rocket that did not follow that flight path. Many of you have seen this rocket footage floating around or flying around. And this rocket footage is from the Go Fast rocket launch. If you've never seen it, it's record breaking. You've never seen a rocket go this fast or this high or this straight up. Usually they curve downward, as you just saw in the video, but this one did not. And it's made a lot of people open their mind to the fact that maybe that's why our pictures of Earth are composites. Maybe that's why they invented the story about the Van Allen belts and why we can't go to deep space anymore and send people that far. But this rocket made it 73 miles high, and then it came to an instant stop like you're about to see. So watch and listen. Here it is again. And like I said before, draw your own conclusions. It could have ran into gravity, but check out the side view. Luckily they had a camera facing sideways, and you can see the horizon when it comes to a stop. You could also see what looks like the moon far off distance as this thing is spinning, and that horizon looks very flat. Okay, draw your own conclusions about that. Could have been the fisheye lens. However, I saw another rocket launch. This time it was at night. And people ask, why did that rocket not explode if it was moving that fast? That's a great question, a legitimate question. I'm not going to avoid that question because I think there were some miraculous circumstances and some properties about the firmament that we did not understand. People say, well, it's a solid glass dome. Well, that could probably be partly true. However, this dome, this solid expanse, like a molten looking glass, they call it in the Bible, is impenetrable. We've tried to blow it up before during Operation Fishbowl. I won't go too much into that aspect of it and the history of it. I trust that you'll look into it after you see what you're about to see later on. But this rocket at night was traveling and doing some weird things like we've seen rockets do before at night and it's very mysterious and there's really no explaining exactly what we're seeing but we do know that this thing is doing something weird <laughs> and I was looking at it and watching it and going well it doesn't look like it hit the firmament and then to my surprise I seen some ripples and you're about to see them move across what appears to be the firmament and there they go these ripples look just like ripples you've seen on water, but this is really, really far away. These are giant ripples moving outward. I thought that was spectacular. I had never seen anything like that. And those are my first clues that these rockets might have been hitting something. And this might be partly why they are lying about deep space and sending us all sorts of animations. Then I came across these sprites which is a phenomenon known as upper atmospheric lightning and people don't know about this your common person does not know about these things and they occur way above clouds clouds are around three and a half miles high sprites occur about 65 70 miles high where those rockets were coming to a stop and these scientists they show a documentary this was by nova it was on pbs and didn't really think much about it when i first saw it until I started putting the pieces together. And then I saw 
something, a barrier, light up above this sprite. And I thought, what if this is the firmament? And I analyzed this footage. I would slow this footage down. I would change the brightness. And sure enough, I started seeing what I thought I was seeing. The firmament. Put there by our Father and the story of creation. It's been there all along. And it's so sad that we've missed it and missed out on seeing his glory for our whole lives. But there it is. And you're about to see a wave move across it. Kind of like the ripple you saw with the rocket. There's that wave. It's bright shooting out of it. And yes, that's a wave. It's not a cloud that you're seeing light up. Again, this is many miles above the clouds. You are seeing the firmament. And this footage was taken down in another video that I put out and blocked in the United States. And for good reason. Because it's waking many people up. They are seeing this solid proof that there's a barrier that these things are shooting out of. These sprites that were mentioned in the book of Enoch. When it talked about stars rising up and becoming lightning and not losing their form. I thought that was crazy. That book was removed from the Bible. And it explained exactly how our system works. The math behind it and everything. But there's the firmament. You can see it. Again, draw your own conclusions. The fact that it's right where those rockets were stopping is no coincidence. Don't take my word for it. Keep looking into it. But I'm going to show you some more proof that the sun, moon, and stars are not light years apart, like we've been told. The nearest star, if it's as far away as they say it is, we would be able to observe that in one night while looking at star trails. However, that's not what we see. We do not see the types of parallax that we can prove that we would see. And I know people say, well, it's a different type of parallax because you're only seeing the stars from a spinning Earth. Well, there's experiments you can do with a camera that you spin as if it were Earth with lights placed at various distances. And when you use the scale that the heliocentric model gives us, it's really hard to do on Earth because it's so far away. But this man here from Cody's lab, his name's Cody, he hates us. But I'm going to use his work. And he shows you if that's the moon and the Earth right there. They're really close together. They're really tiny dots. Here's the sun. And no, that's not how close we are to the sun. He's just showing you size-wise. They're a couple feet apart. And he spaces them apart. But uh, the moon and the Earth and the sun at the end of his measuring tape. And he lays them out. He's laying out some of the planets, Jupiter and Pluto, and all of that. There's Pluto. So he's laying these out on a football field. And then he goes to show us where the nearest star would be. And his journey takes him really far. Not just across town. He actually has to leave the state. He drives over 120 miles away using the scale with those tiny little dots that you saw to show us where the nearest star is. That blew a lot of people's minds and really kind of furthers that fantasy of deep space. However, I saw time lapses of these star trails and I've seen them moving with the moon. And as I saw them, I noticed they were all moving at the same speed as if they were the same distance away from the Earth. And thought, hmm, shouldn't be seeing that. Or should I? I don't really know. Let me do some tests to prove all things. And then I saw the sun and the moon moving through the sky in a time lapse. And they were moving at the same speed and making light trails that were the same size. And I thought, well, if I can set up an experiment that will prove to me that a spinning camera would do this with lights at various distances, maybe I will look back into this heliocentric model that was invented by someone who just looked at the stars in the 1500s. So I set up my camera and some distant lights and I got this idea from a genius at another channel. His name was Chris Van Matter. And I had seen an experiment where he had done this on a small scale and produced some shocking results. And so I set up a camera, did my own experiment, and sure enough, the, the light trails that I was seeing looked very similar until I traced one of the lights that were about that was about half a mile away and 
drug it down to a light that was probably 25 feet away from my camera. Not even close to the scale that Cody was using. It would have been much closer if that was the sun. It would have been a couple feet away. But I was trying to be biased to the globe. And the light trail was a completely different size. And you could imagine the difference you would be seeing if that distant light was 120 miles away. If we could cut through that much atmosphere, you would see a dramatic difference. And our stars and what we're seeing up above us would look totally different. This is something you can do yourself. Do not believe me. Do not trust me. I could be lying to you. But I hope you're starting to see that we don't need a whole lot of crazy theories to prove the truth. We don't need an Albert Einstein figure who they have put in place to create such theories. Up is up. Down is down. Straight and level is straight and level. There are many more proofs out there. You just have to look up, see for yourself, look at the stars, look at the sun, make sure you're using eye protection. <laughs> but figure this stuff out. It's really awesome. The truth and the fact that they have been able to pull one over on us for so long is quite impressive. But go ahead, suck it up, admit that you were fooled, no big deal, swallow your pride, and do some investigation. The truth really does sound crazy. But once you find out the truth, the lies that you believe sound a whole lot crazier. I encourage you guys to share this before it's deleted again. Download it, mirror it, upload it, whatever you want to do free for anyone that wants to use it. I love you guys. The Father loves you way more than I do and sacrificed a lot more for you than I ever will. I pray and ask that you get to know Him and understand who you really are and that it's okay to lose the things of this world to gain something that you cannot lose, that you do not deserve. And I ask that it sets you free for the Father's glory, Yahuwah Elohim, the one true Father who made of this earth, who made the heavens, and He loves you. And I thank Him for sending me here to tell you this and so that you understand exactly who you are and who He is. May His love and peace be with you forever.